Hey everyone, this is Wild That Itches, uh, aka Justin Coleman, Rockstar Data Scientist. Traveled all the way from Detroit down to uh, sunny Miami to escape the winter. Uh, I am here with Emerge, a uh, very talented street artist from what I can see. Uh, Emerge, the focus of my channel is really like people talking about why why they took a different path, why why they did something different other than the same old, same old that you know the world forces us into. Uh, anything you want to say about what it is that you do or what drove you here? Uh, I mean... I guess with the graffiti thing, it, it more chose me than I chose it in a sense or whatever. Like, I had uh, cousins that were that were into it. I wasn't even really that into it at first. I always uh, drew since I was a little kid. Um, and then at about I think uh, 14 years old, I went out with one of my cousins and and caught the bug. And after that, I was just pretty much addicted to to painting and. You know, like whether I was getting paid for it, whether I was fucking just going out and, I mean, in the beginning it was really just wrecking shit and going out and hitting up illegal shit. But um, I even tried to formally retire um, <laughs> at one point from the illegal side of things, but it lasted about six hours. <laughs> so I know I know myself well and like, you know, it's... Uh, it's just what I love to do. So, it, like I said, it, it more chose me than I chose it, in a sense. I feel that. So you just found something that you love, and, and regardless of how, how how you got here, you just you kept uh, pursuing it, grinding it out, making sure um, you got to do your art. Honestly, uh, how I got to, to the place I'm in now, honestly, would just be, uh, you know, being at the right place at the right time. You know, in, in most situations, that's 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 all it is. If, if you're talented enough and you're in the right place at the right time, um, somebody will see it. Somebody will find you. You know, like uh, somebody's always looking to make money off of you as soon as they, <laughs> they see the ability to. <laughs> <laughs> That's, ain't that the truth? What's been your favorite piece that you've done, whether legal or illegal? Um... That's hard to say. Like, they're all my favorite. They're all like like my children. So it's hard for me to call any one of them in particular my favorite. Um, the biggest joke, I guess, as an artist that we have is we, we say the last one, you know, the last one I did. <laughs> but uh, but I, I don't know. I have more of an affection, I think, a lot of times for the the illegal stuff than the legal stuff. Like the, the legal stuff is really fun and, and I get paid good money for it. And I'm, I'm super thankful for it, at, you know, at the same time. But the illegal stuff was always more like the addiction and more like like, you know, at one point as a teenager, my biggest joke was that I sold drugs to fund my graffiti habit. So, you know. Yeah, it seems to be actually a, a big part. So I, I grew up uh, Chicago housing projects and relocated to Detroit. I uh, spent a lot of time in Detroit and Flint. So, you know, seeing, uh, seeing street art is something that I'm used to. It seems to be uh, really popular here in Miami. Do you know roughly about how, how large this Wynwood Walls area is? It looks pretty big. Um, yeah, it's, it is, I want to say it's like 40 square blocks or something like that, or maybe 50 square blocks. It's, it's from 20th all the way to 36th. And, and it extends out a little. Like now, because the, you know, because of the neighborhood, it's branched out into, into other neighborhoods like Little Haiti and, and and I mean the graffiti was always in these neighborhoods too, but it just was more prevalent in, in this one because this area was like all industrial and so it would shut down at like three o'clock. You know, come three o'clock, everything would close down. And then it was scary as fuck. It was just full of like Puerto Rican gangs and craziness and people getting shot and robbed and you know, so um it was like a war zone to ride through here and then, you know, it gave us um as graffiti artists, a uh, a playground, a place for us to climb on the roofs and paint, and not have to worry about cops because cops had bigger problems, and they they barely went in this neighborhood anyway. So, you know, they could they could care less <laughs> at, that, at that point. Yeah, I've seen them posted up all down like uh, South Beach, uh, pretty much um, all all throughout downtown. The other night, down at the Bayside Market, they closed well, up the whole market. Now, now they they have the, the the presence here as well. Like anywhere in Miami where there's a a big tourist presence, and you see tour buses going around, like you see here, yeah. you know, here South Beach, Brickell, like all these areas have heavy police presence to stop any 
people from getting, you know, froggies and leaping from any criminals from from wanting to rob, murder, steal, <laughs> you know, yeah. that, whole, that whole situation or whatever. So they, they police it heavily, even though uh, the other night there was a shootout right here on this street, not even two blocks away. So I was out here painting and I heard the whole shit popping. You said that already? All right, bet. That's what I said, because this thing's going to run for two years. I just thought about it. Uh, I'm going to put it on the frame of the scooter. You see how I put my name and my, my homie's name in there and the block boy shit? Like, it's it's going to look like the the scooter's got stickers on it, so the different logos is going to be the... I'm going to send it to you right now. But it'll be perfect for you to come shoot the shoot oh, no, content I'm here, I'm here, with. I'm here, I'm here, all the... right the so you know, so Yeah, no, YouTube, so... Definitely, definitely. All right, my brother, appreciate you. Yeah, and that's uh, another interesting, you know, thing or whatever. But as artists, we've learned to monetize people's interest in what we do. Like rappers sit here and ride around this neighborhood, and because you know my art is very sharp and I'm well known all over the world, they want to get me and pay me to put their logos and stuff in my artwork, and I, I don't mind doing it as long as they pay me. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's a good way to get get paid. Uh, there was a, a kid that at, at one point when I was a teenager and I was heavy in the graffiti scene and I had like one of the largest collections of paint. Like I just had paint stashed for days. This kid said, you racked all that paint? And I said, kind of. And now if you don't understand what racking means, when we were kids and we were poor, we couldn't afford this paint, we would steal it. And it was called racking. And it was like part of the, the whole bucking the system. Like we steal the paint that we paint with, you know, you, you're forced to see our artwork and we stole the paint to do it with type shit. <laughs> well, I had a different premise in my mind because I just wanted more paint and more selection. So I uh, I sold drugs and I, I probably Sorry. say it. <laughs> I have no problem saying it. And uh, my joke was that I, I rack racks and, and then buy paint, you know, like I do other criminal acts. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> and then use that money to buy the paint, which to me just made more sense. Like that way I could get whatever paint I wanted, whatever markers I wanted, didn't have any problems with the stores. And also there was stuff popping up like graffiti stores, like actual shops, like mom and pop type shops that supported graffiti and had specific paint and markers and different shit like that. So I also wanted to like put money in these people's pocket. You know, like I wanted to buy the 12 ounce profit magazine and I wanted to, you know, buy paint from their shop and tips and all this stuff. And I couldn't do that unless I sold, sold drugs. So. Hey, and sometimes it's about survival. Look, you know, everybody right. does things that everybody, they gotta do. Yeah, everybody has different options, man. Like if I had an allowance, I would have spent it on that. Like if I had a, a you know privileged childhood where I could have done it, but no, I was like the son of immigrant parents and I, I couldn't even risk to get caught by them. I was more scared of getting caught by my parents doing graffiti than actually getting caught by the cops. Hmm. I was more worried about the cops catching me and turning me over to my parents. Yeah. So like that was more of a, a fear for me when I was doing graffiti than the actual police. Yeah. Now, one of the things you said was um, you started this at 14. The, the one thing that I touch on with everybody I talk to, everybody focuses on the end of the glow up, right? Like how you got here, how you're able to do this and travel around. Realistically, though, how long did it take you? Was it a long grind? Was it did it was it overnight? Um, I, I, I did different shit. Like I said, so I, I started working at a very young age. I became uh, I was I was so in love with hip hop. I was mixing music on on a on a boombox like a double deck. My grandmother's like Senyo fucking double deck boombox and making mixtapes at like eight nine years old. By the time I was 13, I had already DJed parties for, you know, kids in high school and shit and got my first job in a ice skating ring in Pompano Beach uh, <laughs> DJing. So at 13, I got my first like professional DJing job. And besides DJing, I was still a bag boy at fucking Publix and selling weed. So like to me, the hustle and the grind started at a young age and I was just a lot different. Like people were in school and worried about social interactions and friendships and shit like that. 
and I was worried about you know going and promoting my show and like making sure people showed up you know and collecting my money for you know shit and and smoking my bud and not getting caught by my parents doing my graffiti and you know like just I had a, a whole different intrigue of of things that I was into and it, it started at a very young age and that helped me to make a lot of connections in different industries, music industry and stuff, and, and progressed. And one day, uh, years years later, after like, I, I actually became very successful painting murals in, in, in high-end homes, doing like faux finishes and, and Trump Loy shit, and having the contract for city furniture and Miami subs doing all their tropical shit and all their framed artwork and, and all this shit. And so I was, I was very successful. I just didn't like working for millionaires and billionaires that, you know, like gave me stringent rules about not being able, able to play my music or talk or didn't like the fact that I smell like weed. So I just decided I was gonna like go and try to break into the weed industry. And it was a complete fail. Like it was, it was a complete like fall on my face fail. Like I had been growing weed, selling it, like I was, in my mind, I'm like, I'm in the weed industry. Like, how can I not break into like the head shop and like weed industry like that way? Like, how come I can't do it? And uh, and it took somebody that I knew calling me one day and asking me about uh, about uh, BHO, about about concentrates and and passing you know that on and, and me doing a custom torch for him. And that's what changed the game. And that's what what blew everything up. And and. I started actually pioneering the, the whole dab culture and became like one of the people known for that. So, you know, Wiz Khalifa had my torch. So in a sense, my, my sculpture work started taking off and that's what became more popular among people, even though my graffiti had been in the streets for, for years and all over the country and, and, and all that, my, my little sculptures started going all over the world. And I started being seen as this person that was, like I said, a pioneer in this culture. I took the biggest dabs. I, you know, like I was at all the events, just being epic, you know, you know, not to be like braggadocious, but that was like just part of it, like putting on a show, being grand, you know, like, and, uh, and I was just trying to show people that the shit couldn't hurt you. Yeah. You know, like that, that was medicine, that it definitely couldn't hurt you, that, that there was nothing wrong with it, that even though they were trying to make it seem like it was some crazy shit, like. You know, I smoked, I want to say it was like 28 grams in three hours. And, you know, like if it was poison or anything like that, I would have been dead. Yeah. Like I would have been dead 10 times over. So, so, um, yeah, that's, that's actually what, what became like my, my lore and like people like, like, uh, little peep started following me and wanting to hang out with me and shit and, and, and Trapzilla, which was uh riff raps DJ was one of the first ones that came like a puppy dog. It's so crazy. I hate to say this story like that because I don't want to diss him. He's a really cool cat. I, I really love him. I have so much respect for him. But when I say like a puppy dog, it was because I wasn't used to this feeling and I was just walking to an event because I'm a humble dude. I parked my, my little Scion XB and I, I'm, I'm walking to an event. And I don't realize like how popular I am in, in this culture and like how how big this shit is and how worldwide it is. And this, this guy just approaches me and he's like, oh, I'm a huge fan of you. And I'm like, Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of you too, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> I just kept walking towards the venue. He's like, I'm Riff Rats DJ. And I was just like, okay, sure. I, I'm from Miami. I've heard a lot of stories. You know, we're in Denver right now, but sure, I, you know, whatever. Okay. And so I just keep walking. I never like pay it too much mind. And, you know, he doesn't even like, I don't even remember if he bought a torch at the show or not or what happened after that. But I do remember that I did have the connection to Riff Raff, that Riff Raff had one of my torches already and another glass artist um, wanted to give him a piece. So I was going to, to meet with him, his his uh, hype man, Panama Jack or whatever, was the one that set it up. And so we're there in the room with two uh, escorts because that was on his rider. I thought that was awesome. A gram of cocaine and two escorts was on his actual rider. <laughs> and if you don't know what a rider is, it's what the uh, artist gives the promoter of the venue to let them know what they need to perform <laughs> so we're in the we're in the hotel <laughs> with that or whatever and uh in comes panama jack with riff raff we we do the introduction he sees the the hash and all this or whatever and he's like oh you know who love this 
and he's, he says this guy's real name. I'm not going to say this guy's real name just because I don't know if he wants it out there. But he says the guy's real name. And so I don't even think about it, you know, like, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, let him let him come down. And I'm like, oh, all right, cool. And when he comes down, man, sure enough, bro, it's the fucking guy that introduced himself. It's the kid that introduced himself as Riff Raff's DJ. It was Trabzilla himself. <laughs> he was actually walking with another friend of mine. Um, that's in, that was in the weed industry. So it was like a, like a, you know, Hey, what's up? You know, like saying, saying hello, but it was just like small world. Huh? You know? <laughs> like, yeah. But that was, that was one of the things where I, 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 um, it took away that, that like underestimating people. Like I, I didn't underestimate them at the same time. I didn't fully believe them <laughs> but at the yeah. same time. I didn't like call them a bullshitter. And I'm kind of thankful that I didn't, cause if not, that might've been an embarrassing, you know, situation when he walked in. But, uh, but yeah, like that type of stuff has always been a, a weird adjustment or a weird thing to get used to. And like I said, being a street kid where like when somebody walked up on you before, it was like, yo, yeah. fuck, watch out, <laughs> like, get away from me. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very compelling story, you know, and, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth or anything like that. But, but to recap, you know, it seems like, you know, you started off early, you put in the hours, you put in the grind. Nobody handed this to you. You were prepared, though, when, when that opportunity was ready. Oh, yeah, yeah. Basically, I mean, like, it was just, like I said, one of those things where it was time and place. It landed in, in my lap and and I just happened to be like, you know, fuck it. You know, I'm going to run with it. And I, I, I walked away from, uh, you know, the, the successful career that I had in, in a sense and fully committed to doing this and, and jumped all the way in. And it it, it put me in some predicaments with some people and in interesting situations, but it made for quite the ride. And if if um, if people don't don't know this yet or whatever, it's not the destination, man. It's the fucking ride. You know what I'm saying? Like it definitely is. So um, and, I, and I'm still on that ride, like, you know, still daily on that on that same ride. I still embrace every day with that same, you know, like genuine curiosity and and i'm open to to see just you know maybe, maybe not as as uh angry and as close-minded as i was at one point <laughs> unless you fuck with my artwork if you fuck with my artwork i still still kind of crazy about that <laughs> yeah so, no we, we we won't be doing that i was i was yelling at random strangers because they were tagging somebody's mural over there and i was just like bro what the fuck are y'all doing there i was like you're lucky it's not mine because i wouldn't have warned you <laughs> I just came up and slapped you. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, we, we've been chatting here for a few minutes. Uh, I know you got probably some painting left to do. So is there any last things you want to say to the tons of viewers that I have <laughs> about pursuing your goals or anything that you want to share uh, uh, from the top of your dome? I guess it's not about how many times you miss because you only got to make it once. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? Like... So, you know, you just got to keep pushing. I, I guess uh, my, my father's adage on that or whatever is is uh, being stubborn isn't always the best thing, but there's certain things that being stubborn is really good about. So just be stubborn and be determined, you know, be stubborn about succeeding. And, and that's it, you know. Hey, thanks, Emerge. Thank you so much.